Project management has evolved over the years. Now, the evolution has grown to include things like planning, coordinating and controlling of complex and diverse activities of modern industrial, commercial, and management change and IT projects. But you have to remember that all projects share one trait, projection of ideas into new endeavors. And so the actual reason behind project management, therefore, will be to foresee or predict as many of the damages and problems as possible. Now, this way you are in a position to plan, organize, and control activities so that the project can be completed successful in spite of the risks. The thing you have to remember, however, is that the ever-present element of risks and uncertainty means that the event and tasks leading to completion of projects can never be foretold with absolute accuracy. Now, in the world of project management, okay, we talk about commercial and industrial, it's almost impossible, okay, it's hard to find an accomplished project manager who doesn't have a history of a problem with a project, okay? Here's what I'm talking about. Projects that have exceeded their cost by a large amount, finished late, or even have been abandoned before completion. Well, there are many reasons why projects fail, just as much as there are many reasons that will support the success or will make it possible for a project to be successful. Which are some of the things that you learn by the end of this course and all this series of videos. But uh, for starters, let's talk about a brief history of project management. Now, the interesting thing about looking at projects from the ancient time, okay, is that um, they always leave us, you know, bewildered, okay? It's always like, how did they manage to do that? I mean, we ask ourselves many questions when you look at these prehistoric kind of projects. How did they manage such without technology that is readily available today and relatively cheap? These are some of the questions that you ask ourselves after looking at some of these marvel architecture that were done way back during the, you know, the, 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 before the Victorian times, okay? But uh, what you really don't see is the dark side of this project. It's not even the dark side. It's just that there were other issues that were actually not taken into account when these projects were being done. I mean, I'm talking about things like concern for the welfare and safety of workers was generally lacking. You don't really think the people who are building pyramids were interested in uh, union or medical care for their workers, now are they? They are not. But the, the whole idea was just people were looked at as cheap labor. The other thing also is that back then, formal structures were not entirely as a result of industries, rather military, religion, or civil administration. In 1368 to 1644, during the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese bridge building team was more likely to be an army team than an industrial team. The third thing is that there wasn't a separately recognized profession of project management. Common sense, determination, hard work, usually at the expense of neglecting personal health, used to get the job done. So who was managing projects back then? Projects before the 1900s, okay, were being managed by creative architects or engineers. That is how you end up with people like Sir Christopher Wren, okay, 1632 to 1723. The guy was accorded the responsibility for rebuilding 52 churches in the city of London after the Great Fire. Also, the guy responsible for St. Paul's Cathedral in Ludgate Hill. Okay, you end up having people like Thomas Telford, who was a civil engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who was an English civil engineer considered one of the most ingenious and prolific figures in engineering history. And I'm also certain if you just dig deep into your history, okay, the history of your country, you'll also realize that there are things which were done by people who are, well, you could currently call them project managers, but they weren't. They, they really, you know, they, 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 they was, there was no that profession. But the point is that even as back then, okay, we, we still had projects. Now let's move on. 1900 to 1949. So this period saw rapid growth in industrialization. We're talking about world wars now having taken place and whatever, you know. So we ended up having management scientists. I'm talking about people like Elton Mayo, Frederick Winslow Taylor. I mean, these are guys you study, okay? These are guys you study when you do any management course, especially when talking about evolution of the management thought or the early school of management thought. You end up having guys like Mayo, okay, or Taylor. Henry Ford made production line famous with his Model T automobile. You also end up having Henry Gantt. Yep, 
the guy of the Gantt chart, which are going to, which is really an important tool in project management. The Gantt chart. It's something that it's something that you're going to to see as you as you continue. Okay, it kind of helps you in project scheduling. So, um, you know, most of these most of these uh, guys back then, they you know they, they weren't really project managers. They were just management scientists and whatever it is that they had. Okay, that knowledge, that experience, those skills ended up playing a big role in management. And if it helped in management, it was definitely going to help in project in project management. Now, moving on, 1950 to 1969. At this point in time, computers are becoming part of the game. And by computers here, I'm talking about mainframe computers, not, not, not the kind of computer that you currently have, you know, the desktop, the laptop, your smartphone. Not really. It's a mainframe, okay? These were, they, they, they were big stuff. In fact, the American defense industry and DuPont were actually among the first organizations to quickly exploit this powerful planning and scheduling tool in 1950s. Manufacturing, construction companies saw this as well. And, well, they weren't going to be left behind, so they jumped into the thing, okay? They jumped into the, 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 the speed that was, the processing speed that was being offered by computers in terms of project management. The problem with these computers also meant that uh, they were capital intensive. And so it wasn't like if every company had one, okay? And so, well, that, that was the thing. They, they were, you know, they, they, were, they were expensive. So you're talking about a computer that needs its own room, okay? Its own air-conditioned room. And that is not really the reason why you are starting a business. You aren't starting a business to, to have a house to finance a computer. And so the mainframe computer meant that work was being shared. But still, at least things like critical path were now being relatively faster, okay? By critical path, I'm talking about network tools, which you shall see in, uh, in project management as we continue. But these are tools that were helping in, um, in planning, okay? In the planning process of project management. This period also saw the recognition of project management as a recognized job description. And uh, the interesting thing also about this period is that companies are now starting to show more concern, okay, more concern for the welfare of their workers. Even though we still had problems with discrimination, okay, I'm talking about dis discrimination on the grounds of things like race, gender, age. But at least, you know, right now, it, in terms of project management, not in terms of other social problems, in terms of project management, at this period, project management was now starting to be recognized as a, as a job description. You know, you could approach somebody and say, hi, I'm a project manager, and they'll be like, yeah, sure, okay. And like in other era where that was just, you know, no idea what that was, okay. Now let's move on to the next phase, 1970 to 1979. So this period saw rapid growth in technology, and soon you ended up with IT or information technology. Now project management took two shapes, okay. There was number one, industrial project management, which continued to grow, okay, and uh, the software is being used in project management as at that time also continued to grow. And number two, IT project management. These are people who had no project planning or scheduling experience and no desire or interest to learn those methods. What they actually had were the technical, okay, and mental capability to lead people into developing project uh, IT projects. That's all they had. They were mostly senior system analysts and since there were few, scarcity created a high demand for their, for their positions, okay? And that meant that they could skip from one organization to the other. And they really did make money because, well, imagine uh, being some guy who understands IT, okay? In, um, well, in 1970. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that there are not many people like you, okay? And so with that, you really become marketable. So these guys were really, you know, they, 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 they really made money. The next era, now we're talking about 1980 to 1989. At this point, we start having desktop computers. And what does that mean? Well, that means now computers are available to pretty much, well, most people still, not everybody, but most people. And like the first, first era, we were talking about mainframe computer. Now we're talking about desktops, okay? These are things you can find in offices. Software and graphics were also improving. The problem, however, was that, I uh, see, these are, at that point, you're talking about computers being new thing. It's like uh, when smartphone, smartphones came into existence. People are more interested in the new thing than actually getting the job done. And so when you walked around offices, okay, project management offices, what you ended up with were people crowding um, around a computer. And some of the questions they were asking included things like, have you tried this? What happens if you do this? Where has my work gone? 
But the good thing is that uh, the processing speed was faster and therefore projects could be, changes in the projects were quickly done and, uh, you know, quickly printed out and people could, you know, the, the project managers that then could faster, you know, could make decisions faster and handle the project. But um, see, that's the thing about technology. And then you end up in the next situation or the next era, which was 1990 to the present. So the thing about the 90s is that suddenly software manufacturers realized that they need to make softwares that are compatible with the Windows operating system. Okay. And uh, Microsoft wasn't left behind. They also came up with their MS project, the Microsoft project, which is a software that is still out there. Okay, if you want to use it, you can use it to manage the project. Although there are many other softwares, so I'm not really like, recommending that one. I'm just saying that it's a software and it's there. And currently we have other, other softwares that you can use to manage project. But the point is that at this point, um, things are faster. Okay, like um, softwares are there. Project management is recognized. We, ha we end up having bodies that are now responsible for a, a kind of, you know, an, an association of project managers, bodies like that one are coming into existence. Okay. There was also a wider acceptance that managing company change as project can bring faster and better results. And so project management was no longer split into two, the IT and whatever, the industrial thing. Nope, it was just one thing. Or it is one thing as you currently know it. So this is where we are. And that's how project management um, evolve from the pre-Victorian era all the way to where you currently are now sitting there studying project management. So you're all caught up, okay? Now, um, I don't really know what you want to do with the knowledge you get from this course, which is interesting. So, you know, we could communicate. You could tell me about that. You could inbox me. You could just write it there. What exactly do you really want to do with this knowledge? What do you really hope to achieve by the time you're done with this course? That way, I can always look at the messages and see if the course was helpful to you or if it wasn't. Or if there is anything that I can help with in terms of questions, you can also do that. I'm Moses, and I'll see you in the next video.